Thank you both so much. This is going to be going to be great. Um, Dr. Tijani, I, I wanted to ask you about this. You're 90,000 kilometers of, of cable uh, that you're building over the next two to three years. It's this massive $2 billion investment. What does that mean? What does that do for the adoption of AI in Nigeria? Um, thank you for the question. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what does it mean for the adoption of AI? I think we need to start before even talking about artificial intelligence. We need to look at the reality of the country. Nigeria is a nation that is extremely blessed. Uh, about 70% of our people are under the age of, I think, about 25, thereabout. Um, when you look at our nat natural resources, there's so much of it going on. There's so much we can contribute to the world. But I think there's this age-long set of challenges that we've faced as a people, and there are three of them that I often talk about. First one is optimizing the use of our resources. Right? How do we ensure that we're using our resources uh, appropriately and in the right ways. The second is raising the level of productivity across our key sectors. So many people will talk about the state of the nation, but when you look at the agriculture sector, you see that Nigeria is not uh, optimal in that sector, so we can't even feed ourselves. Uh, when you look at education, there's so much we need to do in that space that we currently can't do. Transportation, name it, healthcare, and the third one is this conversation that we must diversify our economy, mm -hmm. right? Government after government has been working on diversifying the economy. So if there's anyone in the room with the slightest understanding of economics, you understand that you can't really drive up total factor productivity without the introduction of technology. So this is why technology is important, is why connectivity is important. It's not just a good to have uh, uh, tool. There's absolutely no way for any African country to develop without investing in technology. But we also then know that digital technologies are the frontier set of technologies that are changing the world, right? We've seen it in Nigeria. If you look at the current startup ecosystem, which I was fortunate to be part of, part of when it started about 15 years ago, the current iteration of it, uh, Nigeria wasn't even rated as a destination for capital at all 15 years ago. But because we've prioritized the startup ecosystem, Nigeria is now top two on, on the list of destinations for funding for startups in Africa. Mm -hmm. So the idea of accelerating the deployment of good fiber optic network is really to give opportunities to every Nigerian, regardless of where they find themselves. So if you're a young person in Calabar, you don't have to move to Lagos for your dreams to be valid. Right? There's a global digital economy that you can be part of. There's content out there that you can consume and use to improve yourself. Mm -hmm. You can work remotely. You don't have to move to uh, New York or anywhere in the world to, to find good, good employment. So for us, the future that we're trying to build mm -hmm. is solidly linked to ensuring that our people are deeply connected. And we have a president that is taking really difficult decisions. You know, whether people like these decisions or not, the reforms that are meant to help us reshape the direction of our economy. But we can't reshape if we don't build. But we know that the young people will build. But you just have to empower them. Look at what we've done in entertainment. You know, people talk about entertainment from Nigeria, but people don't talk about how much connectivity is done to that. The fact that a young person can create a short video in a small corner of Nigeria, and that video can go viral all over the world. So we know that the secret to unlocking possibilities for Nigeria is ensuring that everyone is meaningfully connected, not just being connected via mobile phone, by the way, meaningful connectivity. Yeah, and I do want to, I want to ask Avi a question here about this. You, I know Credo AI is not in Africa, but you are in Brazil and expanding to other emerging markets and APAC, um, and you're, really, you're out there talking about these, you know, to these countries that are, you know, ex like developing AI, right? And they all sort of look at it differently, right? And I just wonder if you could talk about I mean, your, your role is to, is to figure out governance around AI, how to, how to make sure that it's implemented safely and, and according to regulations. But what are the different, different ways that countries look at this? Why do, they, why do they all look at it differently? Yeah, great question. Um, I think you know, I had the, the pleasure of hearing uh, Renata Dewan speak last week, um, and she had this very funny um, critique of the United Nations that 
it moves slowly and breaks things. And I think that this is common refrain we hear in the governance space of we want to capitalize on AI. We need to make sure that we're using it, investing it, developing it, and governance is just going to get in the way. So a lot of the time that, that I spend at Credo AI is talking about how can you have regulation and governance uh, appearing and developing alongside investment and capacity in building for AI. So at Credo AI, that's our focus as a responsible AI governance platform. And when we're in these different markets, the enterprises are asking us, how can we build something responsible and sustainable while capitalizing on the benefits of AI because we don't want to be slowed down. We don't want things to break or not happen. Um, so we look at these regulations, we look at different policies in these markets, and there is a lot of commonality. So from an enterprise perspective, we talk about the ability to have a, a registry or an inventory of your AI systems, being able to have human oversight, um, human in the loop, human over the loop. These are concepts we see in the APAC region. They're also in the United States and Europe. I think Africa has done an amazing job of investing in a lot of national AI strategy development and thinking about these principles as well. But how do you introduce transparency and accountability alongside the development is really our focus. And I would say at the enterprise level, um, we try to share these commonalities and build this into the process. Yeah, do you, do you agree with that, Dr. Johnny? Like this concept of, okay, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse here and talking about controls around this technology. And in the meanwhile, like as you were saying before, we just need to get it here. We need to build it and, and use it. No, no, we're not. I agree. Uh, and, and, you know, people need to understand where this is coming from. So whilst the world is just talking about AI, thanks to uh, chat GPT, this is something Global North has been investing in for years. Yeah. It's already in existence. It's matured. The reason why this conversation is hot at the minute is because of Frontier AI, which everyone knows that it has potentials to be extremely negative in terms of the outcomes for humanity. Uh, and that's why we've prioritized it. You know, if you go back to Nigeria, probably half of the people in the room will tell you, I'm wasting my time working on artificial intelligence. But I actually think every learning Nigerian African should be pushing artificial intelligence because these are a set of technologies that will eventually, it's already doing it, it will eventually determine what we think about, how we think, what we do, your mood when you wake up. Many people already wake up going onto their social media platforms. But these social media platforms are being controlled in terms of what you get to see. The algorithm behind them will determine what they want you to see. And they influence what you spend your day doing. But AI is going to be much more impactful in terms of how we are rebuilding the future of humanity, literally with AI. And there's no future where a certain part of the world is left behind, where a certain part of the world it's not part of that development. So we may end up with massive divide in society because AI is being built from just the perspective of the global knot. That's why we have to prioritize the collection of data set. Mm. We can't leave it to chat GPT to ensure that their models are inclusive because the reality is chat GPT is not gonna to come to Nigeria to help us, or anywhere in Africa, to help us digitize our reality. Yeah. The bulk of our reality is still dark, is unconnected, is not being used to train a lot of these models. We have to accelerate it. We know artificial intelligence is good for humanity, but it's also dangerous if it's not inclusive, and we have to take responsibility yeah. for it. And that's one of your big initiatives in, in Nigeria is, is taking the country's data and making it accessible, right? And that's been a big problem with these data silos. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in AV's view, or maybe there's a back and forth here on like, what are the dangers in doing that? Like, what do you need to look out for as you, as you sort of prepare this data for, uh, for the, these you know, massive large language models? Yeah, well, I think uh, as Dr. Tijani has already articulated, it's important to have that accessibility uh, everywhere in the world, right? AI is a global product. It's a cross-border product in terms of how it's sourced and developed and fine-tuned and trained. So the importance of having data sets available in Africa that are um, culturally and linguistically diverse is going to be critical to the development of AI uh, on the continent. But I think thinking about this globally, I want to tie it back to an issue related to AI literacy, because it's something we hear a lot about, the need to be AI literate. Um, it's something that regulations are calling for. You, know, you must ensure that your organization, your enterprise has developed AI literacy. 
I, I think it's important to unpack what that looks like for AI because we often hear that um, if you are managing your data, if you're doing uh, proper data governance, then you're handling your AI risk. And I want to point out that that's actually not the case because the concepts we've drawn upon from regulation like the General Data Protection Regulation in the European Union ask for you to be a good steward of the data. That's not going to be enough when you're managing AI risks. So again, when we think about building capacity, investing in AI, it's important to invest in AI literacy that also showcases the risks unique to AI, things like accountability, robustness, performance, being able to understand that and develop those alongside the data center investments is going to be critical. Yeah, but I wonder if you worry about being held back in a sense, right? Like in the US, we have all these regulations that really prevent, I mean, we have a lot of data, but there's a lot more valuable data that we can't, that AI companies can't access. Do you worry about that sort of red tape in, in Nigeria? No, no, I that? don't. Um, I think we're fortunate we're one of the few countries on the African continent that is now passed is uh, Data Protection Act. Uh, we have a Data Protection Commission, which is, yeah. I think, just about a year old. Uh, but the reality is the commission in itself, which I supervise, is still playing catch up. Right, uh, you still find developers who are collecting sensitive data and taking them out of the country, mm. uh, you know, in the name of helping to build AI. So, so I think for Africa, we're still far from it. Uh, you know, for Nigeria, if I can speak directly to Nigeria, I think we're still far from the point where regulation will get in the way of uh, people building. Uh, but, but I think the approach we're taking is also saying to ourselves that this is not just the responsibility of government. Uh, where AI is going, it has to be our collective responsibility, which is why we've set up the AI Collective, which we're going to be announcing on the 9th of October, I think, uh, funded by Pierre Omidia, the founder of eBay. And the idea is to bring everyone from civil society organizations, startups, academic institutions, working in artificial intelligence together to help us implement our national strategy, but also ensure that the development of AI in the country uh, takes into consideration safety, but also ethics as well. And we're taking that a further step because we understand, again, government doesn't have all it takes to help us accelerate development of AI. So we're working on designing our national AI trust, which is going to be a body of people from the society that are reputable individuals. Government will have a seat on the trust, and their role will be to ensure that Nigeria is exploring, developing AI uh, ethically, but I think most importantly, because we're also building our large language model, we don't want to take a close approach to it, but we're exploring the possibility of commercializing it. And whatever we make out of it goes into the trust, and that fund is then used to develop AI uh, in the country. That's so interesting. Thank you. I love when we get a little applause here. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, there's, we talked with James Manika from Google earlier about the fact that, that you know, there are 118 countries that just haven't been involved at all in any of these international discussions around AI. So you talked about within Nigeria, but what about outside? Are you, do, you, do you think that's something that needs to happen more in Africa and, you know? Absolutely, I'm actually particularly interested in how uh, developing countries and particularly countries in Africa, how we look for smart ways to be part of the AI race, because as you know, uh, this is an expensive endeavor. Uh, typically, if you talk about AI in Nigeria, people will immediately remind you that we don't have enough electricity, so you can't be part of it. We don't have resources for compute, so you shouldn't be talking about it. Mm. Um, but my take is that there are creative ways in which we should be participating. All right. I think even on the electricity front, there's a unique opportunity for us, because most people talking about investments in, in AI uh, and, and energy are thinking of more smarter, cleaner form of energy. So it's an opportunity for us to reimagine what that will look like. Uh, on the capacity front, uh, it's being projected that in a few years, Africa will power the world when it comes to workforce. Because many countries in the world, population declining, aging, while in Africa is growing. I think Nigeria, we're having about 5 million or so people annually, right? Just about 10, 15 years ago, our population was 160 million. Now we're 230 million. That's projected to continue to grow. So there's no future where Africa is not powering the workforce of the world, not just, not just for Africa. So we have a unique opportunity to also take the role of, of enlightening our people, skilling our youth, 
to ensure that they can actually power that development in the world. And I think lastly is that Africa can innovate around inclusivity in AI data set. Yeah. Because like you're saying, in Global Nodes, you already have uh, digitized content. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we don't. So we can come up with really smart ways to help improve the quality of data set that is being used to train AI models. And that can be an innovation that we bring into the AI ecosystem, which we can easily monetize as well. Right. I think this is interesting, AV. I wonder, you've been to all of these. I think AI summits, right, or uh, many of them. There's one coming up in Rwanda, right? Is that is that on your radar? And like, I wonder if that's a, sh a sign of a shift that the conversation is kind of broadening. Yeah, um, I, I think to Dr. Jirani's points already, the conversation needs to shift. It must. This is a global conversation. The UN, to its credit, with the the recent report released by the High Level Advisory Board on AI emphasize that, that we need a disaggregated but global approach to not only developing and investing, but kind of resolving the asymmetries we see in information and capacity and governance for AI. So yes, I think it's a necessary conversation. Um, it should be on my radar. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to, to be there. So I think that the conversation is important to have all these stakeholders at the table, um, making sure that we're developing the AI safety uh, measurements, metrics, um, ways to invest in that alongside the, the capacity development as well. And, and just to add to this, um, so you're not seeing investment and attention from a lot of countries because conversations around AI is technical. Right. And unlike many other technologies where your private sector can drive its development, there's absolutely no country in the world that is strong in artificial intelligence without the government getting involved. Mm -hmm. So I think the private sector folks needs to prioritize scaling, building the capacity and encouraging government to, to jump on. This is what I've seen. Uh, most countries are not coming on board because there's gap on the public sector side. So if you pay attention to it, any country that is listed in Africa is listed because there's some sort of knowledge in the public sector. It could be one or two people championing it. Mm. And most countries are not. So you may find countries with a startup ecosystem that is quite strong uh -huh. uh, on artificial intelligence, but still you will not find them participating in global conversation because this is not something that is being led just by the private sector. So I think we need to mainstream that building the capacity of governments across Africa and the rest of the world to be able to engage this conversation. It's interesting. I, I think um, you know the the there's been a lot of data center growth in Nigeria, right? I mean, one of the leaders in the in the continent. Um, there's the Amazon GT Bank partnership. I thought was really interesting. Um, but where do you see that going? I mean, speaking of of public private partnerships, I mean, are we talking about one day having accelerated compute clusters in Nigeria? Is that the goal? I think so. So so. Full disclosure, I think Nigeria is still disadvantaged when it comes to these conversations. There are large hyperscalers that are looking to come to Africa. I think they prioritize uh, South Africa, Kenya, ahead of Nigeria. But in terms of uh, you know, business case and the future, yeah. it doesn't make business sense. Uh, because uh, Nigeria has a population, it will continue to grow. Uh, the need for edge technologies will be more we have eight submarine cables. We're investing in 90,000 kilometers of fiber optic network, which is going to be the third longest. Uh, and it's probably going to be the longest eventually, because that network will have the potentials of extending into Niger, Republic of Benin, Cameroon. Um, so it's not a country that we can look down on. It's not a choice as to whether the energy is more consistent in East Africa or Southern Africa. And that's why you're not going to come to Nigeria. I think in Nigeria, we have good body of water, which is required for future focus uh, data centers. I think in terms of energy, we can be creative uh, right. in terms of finding new sources of energy to well, power was, this data center. Sorry to interrupt, but there was the geothermal deal in Kenya with Microsoft. That was yep. interesting. I'm wondering if you, do you, um, what have your conversations been like, like with the hyperscalers? What, it's not been as progressive. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> what are their, yeah. what's standing in the way? Like, what's their biggest, what do they say is the biggest? Uh, it's, it's a conversation that is much more than just a country and, and one, one hyperscale or two. 
it's, 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 it's also at a government level. If you look at what's happened in, in, in Kenya, it's not just been com company to country, it's been country to country. The U.S. worked with Kenya to make that deal happen. Yeah. And I know there's conversations as well uh, on possibilities in Nigeria. Yeah, maybe, A.V., you can make a quick point on this. Like, is, that, is it important for these countries to be able to control their own fate when it comes to, like, inference and compute? Yeah, I, I think when it comes to AI, as we all know, it's very contextual. It's very context and use case specific. And there's always going to be different approaches to risk thresholds and uh, what's acceptable risk. So um, again, pointing back to countries and the way that they can kind of collaborate on a global level, there's a lot already existing in different fora like OECD, UN, GPI. Um, but I think it's important that we recognize when stakeholders are not at the table for seemingly, um, I guess, unsexy topics like standards, because they're the underpinning of what enterprises are going to do. When we look at the enterprises, they're not so concerned with politics and what's happening at this geopolitical level, but if they're required to do something by a standard, by an internationally accepted standard, they're going to implement that as a company. And then wherever they go, they're sort of raising the bar in that way. So I think that's another critical piece of the conversation. Well, we've got a lot to look out for the next few years. I'm interested. Thank you so much, both of you. Appreciate you. it. Thank you.